Good morning. Um, welcome to today's drop-in story club on Circle of Friends by Dahlia Batolin Sherman, led by Marva Shalev Marum. I'm Noah Albaum, and I coordinate programming for the Jewish Community Library, which is a program of Jewish Learning Works. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, this program is made possible in part by Allison Green, and we are grateful to all of the friends of the Jewish Community Library for making all of what we do possible. Um, some quick logistical notes. I'm going to turn on um, closed captioning. OK. So you can access it by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen and selecting show subtitles. And you can turn it off by clicking that button and selecting um, hide subtitles. So there are just a, a, we have a very intimate group today. Um, but we'll still all be muted by default. And during the first half of the program, um, our presenter will be providing us with some background and cultural context for understanding this story. Um, and then in the second half, we'll have a more participatory discussion um, and you will be able to unmute yourselves when it is your turn to participate. Feel free to add your questions or comments to the chat at any point um, and we will get to them time permitting. Marva Shalev Marom is a PhD student at Stanford Graduate School of Education in the concentrations of education and Jewish studies and race inequality and language in education. She holds Bachelor of Arts and Master's of Arts degrees in religious studies from Tel Aviv University. And for over a decade, she's created music education programs in collaboration with Ethiopian Israeli youths in the Tel Aviv area. Her dissertation is a community-based research project done in collaboration with four Ethiopian Israeli teenage girls. Together, they explore the intersections of Jewishness and Blackness in Israel from the perspective of Black, Jewish, Ethiopian, Israeli young women. Thank you so much for joining us today, Marva. Of course, thank you so much, Noah, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you, um, this wonderful group, uh, for being here this morning, um, for making all these adjustments here at Haifa. In Haifa, it's already evening. Um, so I'm really, really grateful to you um, for being here. And I thank the, the Jewish Library in San Francisco for this opportunity to, to have this dialogue here, because for me, um, being in communication with Dahlia's uh, writing and reading this um, this story in Hebrew and in English was really mind opening, and I'm so curious to hear how how does this story speak to you? And maybe we could decode it together. Such a coded story. Now, because the story of Ethiopian Jews, especially Ethiopian Jews who live in Israel, is unbelievably complex. Um, I, I wanted to start with about half an hour of just like asking the very simple, like the simplest questions and trying to get a hold of the ancient past and also the, the, the troubling present in Israel of this community. So um, I will share my screen if that's okay with you. Um, here we are. Okay, let's um, play from start. Yes, okay, I hope you see this. And of course, feel free um, to ask questions and um, especially if there's anything um, like information wise um, right now. And, and if there's something more substantial, definitely we'll have time for everything at, at any point. Um, so yes, um, Dalia Betulin Sherman, a circle of friends and a, will be our window into the uh, lived experience of Ethiopian Jews in Israel. Um, this photo actually is a photo that I took um, with, uh, with my research participants uh, when we were in Ethiopia, when we were visiting their family members who are still there. So that's one hint to who are Ethiopian Jews. So today's agenda, we will start with a wonderful story of Dalia Betolin Sherman. Um, there aren't many photos of her online, so this was one that I could find. Um, so we will start with three questions. Who are Ethiopian Jews? What are they doing in Israel? And what is their Israeli experience? Then we will go to Circle of Friends and we will start um, decoding some themes, especially themes that have to do with names, bodies and politics that I, I could feel them like inside you know, the genius of this story is how everything is embedded in the in the very private personal lives of these um, girls and their cliques at school. So we will try to unravel some of that. And of course, we'll have time for questions um, in the end. So. 
here we go. First, I'll introduce myself a little bit. My name is Malva. I'm from Jerusalem originally. Um, and what I'm going to tell you about and the, the sort of expertise that I'm gaining in the, in the story of Ethiopian Jews is actually not mine. It's something that I'm doing in collaboration with four amazing young women that I actually had the privilege of uh, teaching them music since they were small kids. Um, we met um, in, uh, these, their names are um, Alamnesh, Serkalem, um, Warkitu, and Yeshinat. And um, we met in these settings. I was a teacher soldier in the army. That was what I was doing. I, I was supposed to teach Hebrew to kids. I ended up teaching guitar. And that, en that ended up being a great part of my life. I, I thought I was like a miserable poet until then. And all of a sudden things opened up for me. And later on, I founded a music center in Jaffa. Um, close to Batyam, where were kids of Palestinian families that um, that previously cooperated with the IDF, so they they had to be settled in a place that was more Jewish. They settled there with Ethiopian uh, community members, and in that community we had in that little street we had a small storefront. We taught a lot of music there, and we did a lot of music together. We had um, even classical music going. And um, it, through that experience, I got to know these four amazing young women. And together, we are asking questions um, that have to do with their lived experience growing up in religious high schools. Now it's going back to the story. And, and um, coming from Ethiopia, living in Israel. And how does that have to do with the Judaism and the Jewishness and the Jewish people and Israel and all these things we all share? So. Um, to begin with, um, so this is where I come from. This is the kind of um, emo I bring to this uh, <laughs> to this presentation. And um, we will start with some traditional background. Who are Ethiopian Jews, and what is the Jewish tradition of Beta Israel? So first of all, um, Beta Israel goes by the name of. The Ethiopian Jewry goes by the name of Beta Israel, House of Israel. Um, they are actually among the only Jewish diasporas worldwide that kept the name Israel um, for its entire history. Um, the, other, the only other I know of is the Bnei Israel of India. Both communities were very remote and not part of the halachic um, mainstream. Judaism will return to it later. But this community traces itself to the lost tribe of Dan. In the first destruction of the temple depicted in the Bible, so the 12 tribes of Israel spread across the earth, and the tribe of Dan went to um, went southeast and settled in the Gondar and Tigray areas um, from Egypt um, in today's Ethiopia. Um, and they, this, this um, culture um, and the culture of the lost Dan tribe, they did not return to the second temple. So a lot of the the the, the things that we know about uh, Judaism, like you know Talmud and Mishnah and all these things, are not really part of their canon. They sanctify what they call the Orit, the Old Testament, and you can see a part of it here um, in the right side. You can see it is written in Gez. Gez is ancient Amharic. It is a beautiful, beautiful language. It's one of the only Semitic languages that really preserves um, biblical, um, biblical and other books that we, we don't have in any other languages. Um, so um, Beta Israel, um, they sanctify the Orit and the part like the Old Testament and especially the five books of Moses. And they actually preserved many of um, the customs that were biblical that um, later other Jewish communities uh, went away from. One very um, dominant example, um, yes, we'll start with this, is um, that, that in Beta Israel, the lineage goes by the father. In order to get married in the community, you have to count seven generations back to make sure that there is no blood connection. So the names of the fathers are really important and they're part of every marriage arrangement. Now, the halacha made uh, this test of Jewish ancestry into the mother, and that turned that that became very um, important and troublesome when Israeli citizenship came into question. Now, there is something that we will return to in the story later, which is the meaning of names. In Beta Israel, almost every person has at least 10 names. 
And the names are extremely important until you grow up to be who you are. A child is born and a grandmother looks at him and says, you are my uh, happiness. And she calls him Desta, which is happiness in Amharic. And then his father looks at him and he says, you are strong and I will call you Mandefu, which is power. And um, then the mother says, you are my light, and she calls him Mukat. And then gradually, the child's character comes out, and the name that they end up having is the name that fits them best. And I think that there is a lot of what does it mean to be a child and an individual in this culture is a lot about that. You get your names and the meaning of who you are from your community. Another thing that is very special about Beta Israel is the religious virtue and independence and agency of women. In Beta Israel, women conduct the um, Brit Mila, the circumcision, the ritual circumcision of boys at, at eight days old. And in accordance with the biblical custom of Tzipora, Moses's wife, that circumcised their son. And that was one of the reasons that later Halachic Jews um, questioned their Jewish origins, and we will talk a lot about that because it's an important point. Um, but women were extremely important doing that. They had a lot of communal responsibility, as well as they had their little hideaway. It's called the Margam Gogo. It is a place for menstruating women, and um, it's a little hat that a woman goes to for her entire menstruation, and also after giving birth to a boy and a girl for 40 or 80 days. So women end up having a lot of autonomy. And they have like their own secrets, their own groups, their own, you know, the girls, they have their things and still you can enter any conversation of Ethiopian women and they will, they will stop <laughs> once you enter them. They have their own, their own little circle that was traditionally there. Now, the most powerful, powerful symbol of uh, for Ethiopian Jews and the Jewish Ethiopian community is what they call Jerusalem. Like for them, the longing for Jerusalem was even intensified and all Jewish communities across the earth longed to return to Jerusalem. But for Ethiopian Jews, um, as the lost tribe of Dan, for them leaving Jerusalem in the first place was also the loss of family. You lost any connection with the Jewish people and we will talk about how did they come back to life in the Jewish world. So they lost um, their family and they wanted to come back to the Jewish world. And one of the most powerful um, uh, quotes I found was of Kes, the rabbi, we will talk about what Kes means, um, Tegenye, who said, like a drop returning to the ocean, we will return to Jerusalem. The hope was to be finally, finally um, reunited with the Jewish people as they were a Jewish minority in Ethiopia. They were named Falasha, which is a degrading name that means they're not entitled to inherit or own land. What you can see here in the pictures that I didn't show um, is, um, is the, the kesses, you see their um, big umbrellas. It's the traditional wear of what the kesses wear. And, and you can see that the, the dress of women, these natellas that they're, they're wearing, the white clothes are especially, like they're very special for Ethiopian Jews. Unlike, for instance, the black clothes that we find in Europe, here these were the ones that really made a, a Jewish person who, who recognizable. Um, now, yes. I'm admitting people because I got the chance. Now let's talk about their Aliyah. What happened um, in terms of the Aliyah? You would think a Jewish community that survived for so many centuries alone in Ethiopia, and finally they want to come to Israel and they want to be merging with the Jewish people. So that was and still is extremely complicated. And that's where Dalia's story enters into the picture that we're trying to understand. So Ethiopian Jews were living in Ethiopia and <laughs> guess what? They thought they were the only Jews in the world. They did not know that there are going to be any white Jews. They had no idea. And when the first um, mission uh, people from Kol Israel Chavarim came there um, in the end of the 19th century, and then they sent uh, Yosef Feitlovich to, to 
actually spend time with them. He said, listen, it's miraculous that there is a Jewish uh, community in Ethiopia. They preserved a very, very ancient kind of Judaism, but they need to be with us on the same page and they need to learn from us how to be Jewish. And Jacob Fajitlovich um, brought many students um, to study in Europe, to study in, in the Yeshuv before there was the state of Israel, and to bring back um, sort of rabbinic Judaism or different Judaism back to Ethiopia. They thought it would help. But then, as early as 1942, um, Rabbi Uziel of the chief rabbinate um, said, we cannot consider them as fully Jewish according to the halacha. As I told you, um, do we have some differences, for instance, who conducts the circumcision? Can a woman do it or do male ha men have to do it? And does the lineage go uh, according to the father or according to the mother? All these things and other differences made Ethiopian Jews different. And Rabbi Uziel says if they're not Jewish according to the halacha, maybe their inclusion in the national home for the Jewish people is in question. Now, another person who thought this was a good question to ask was Ben Gurion, the Prime Minister um, of Israel, um, the, the, of the founding of the state and the founding generation. And he said, listen, we are a small country where, you know, surrounded by so many foes. All we, we don't need more political trouble. And Ethiopia is not a Muslim country. It is a Christian country and it's an ally and we cannot, um, we cannot enter into problems with them. Haile Selassie, who was the king of Ethiopia then, was very proud of the Falashas as being part of the Ethiopian diversity. He referred to Ethiopia as a museum of tribes. And he said that, why shouldn't we um, let go of our diversity and, and let these Jews go away? So Ben Gurion did not want that to happen. And basically, only in 1973, when uh, Rabbi Yosef became the chief uh, rabbi of the Sephardic Jews in Israel, and he gained a lot of power and a lot of momentum, he um, made a psikat halacha, and that he judged that Ethiopian Jews are indeed the descendants of the lost uh, tribe of Dan. And he bases his conclusion on rabbinic correspondence from the 14th century, and that was a huge, huge thing for Beta Israel to be finally recognized as Jewish. But there was political turbulence in Ethiopia. Nobody wanted them to, nobody sent any forces to them. So if you ask yourself, how did they get to Israel? You need to learn about this man, Ferede Aklum. He was a Gondar born uh, community leader with a lot of experience in the Ethiopian army too. Um, Ferede Aklum designed a route through Sudan, a walking route from the hilltops of Gondar, Ethiopia, and through the Sudanese desert in order to reach a refugee place with, um, in a place that, that uh, Israel had political relations with and could secretly come and save them. He cooperated with the Mossad agent Danny Limor and their cooperation received a sort of Hollywood depiction in the Dead Sea. Um, uh, the the Dead Sea. Ooh, I forgot the the last name. Of it. it will come back to me. But like it was um, a movie that that was um, maybe somebody knows. Um, yes, the Red Sea. I'll find it in a moment. It will it will return. We're dealing with uh, important stuff. By the end of the conversation, you will have it. Um, oh, the, maybe the Dead Sea Resort or Dead Sea Hotel, it was about, right? It's the Dead Sea Resort. It, it's, a, it's a nice film, um, and uh, I'll be curious what you think about it. Another thing that I want to say that is really important, because we are here in a San Francisco um, context, without American Jewry, Ethiopian Jews would have not made it to Israel. Absolutely. Without the activism of um, American Jews for Ethiopian Jews that would, took years and decades, and in not talking only about the funds that they gave, I'm talking about the, the, the political influence of trying to make Israel feel responsible for this Jewish community. And um, 
throughout, if we'll have more time to return to it later, it is, um, there, there have been a few heroes and heroines um, from the American Jewish community that made this um, possible. And the, the how important American Jewry is for this community, I think it continues um, to be as important. Um, American Jews usually fund many of the programs that um, of corrective education that Ethiopian Jews are now attending after a lot had happened before. But after, I'm sorry, after families walked the desert, um, you would think that they arrived um, in, in Jerusalem of gold, where the streets flow milk and honey. And actually, the moment they arrived, they received the horrible news that they will have to lose their religion in order to gain Israeli citizenship. And if you think about the cognitive dissonance of a Jew that for, you know, centuries sanctified Jerusalem and they had like an open suitcase in the village just to go whenever the gates will be open, all of a sudden they tell them you are not truly Jewish. And if you see this is a demonstration from 1985 and and the the um the, the protesters say, they carry signs that say, chief rabbis, we are Jews. We are waiting for unification of our families because we're not, you probably know the law of return. Whoever is recognized as Jewish by Israel can have automatic citizenship, but Ethiopian Jews aren't. So all of a sudden their brothers and sisters and parents and grandparents cannot come. And they say, honor our Kohanim, honor our, our religion and our our cases, but that did not help. And uh, Ethiopian Jews had to be converted until basically until now for different reasons, though, um, a lot of complexity and I wouldn't want to enter into all that. Just before we leave this, I wanted to to bring you a wonderful quote by one of my research participants. Her, her name is Sarkalem and she's 16 years old. And this is what she thinks about this policy. Saying Ethiopians are not Jewish is the easiest thing to do when you don't want them to have citizenship. Today, our school rabbi gathered all the Ethiopians and explained why the white man tells us to convert. I respect him, but I think that questioning our Jewish tradition is just an excuse. Every rule you bring from the halakha, there's always a disagreement about it. It's called machloket. It's easy to use the halakha to justify anything, but someone always disagrees. You don't want Ethiopian Israel, find a root in the halakha. You do want them, bring a machloket. But you can't say that Ethiopians are not Jewish and that's it, because in the halakha, every question has two answers. Now, Sarkalem is a bright girl and she tells Israel, you are doing a not, not, you're not doing a Jewish thing when you're telling me that I'm not Jewish, because the operating mechanism of the halakha is a diverse mechanism. Even if in the end you have one idea, you still have everything else recorded and you can always return to it. How come all of a sudden everybody agrees that they're not Jewish here? Now, um, one of the things that is important to understand about Israel as a country, a young country with many immigrants, is how important public education is. We're getting nearer to the circle of friends. It is an engine of nation building for every social context, but especially for people who have come from all across the earth. Now, this is a quote of Ben Siyun Dinur. He was the first um, minister of education in Israel. And he says, listen, for 2000 years, we Jews weren't responsible for state and government. Now, now we gather here, expats of different nations, sons of foreign cultures, different educations and conflicting views. Nonetheless, we want to build a home for us all. From former Al Algerians, Moroccans and other Easterners, we must now build a people. The state is the greatest, most efficient tool for the construction of the people. Notice this quote. First, he is saying we are diversity is a challenge for Jews in Israel. We came from so many places and we have different views. Nonetheless, we need to build a home for all of us. But then he says, OK, we need to make a people. But he doesn't say we need to make a people of Germans and um, Spanish people and Italian people, but we need to make people of Algerians and Moroccans and other Easterners. We need to educate them according to a model that was founded by the, by the founders of Israel that all came from an Ashkenazi European background. So, and the last thing that he says is that the state is the greatest, most efficient tool for constructing the people. And for this reason, um, 
public education was always something that um, was important um, for nation building and for um, absorbing immigration. And in the 1950s and 1960s, all these foreign Algerians and Moroccans and Iraqis and Persians and other North African and Middle Eastern Jews were channeled to the religious public education system, to the Makif schools, as part of their absorption process in Israel. Um, the religious schools they attend to this day are different from those who cater to the kids of the Ashkenazi elite, that is the Yeshiva Tichonit and the Ulpana. It's very complex uh, dynamics here, and I would um, I, I would love to explain a bit more um, about this. Um, and oh, I see the question um, about about the um, the corrective education. I I mean. I mean a correction to this. Um, soon I will talk about what, what's the problem with the Eth Jewish education of Ethiopian Jews um, in Israel. And, and, um, and the, the corrective education programs that I meant are usually those that are run after school. And there are many kinds of them. I can tell you that one of my uh, research participants is receiving a scholarship from an organization that uh, supports her jazz music education. And um, so that sort of thing. Um, so and, and supporting young talents and musicians and and um, and many students. But we will understand more about that maybe later after this slide. So religious public schooling or what's called Chemed in Israel is um, uh, it writes in its official website that what it does is that it educates in the spirit of religious Zionism. And when I spoke with the head of the Chemed um, of that education system, when it absorbed um, relig the Ethiopian Jews, he told me, listen, they said we are Jews. We said, we don't know what you are. Public education was the compromise. So as part of the conversion um, policy that conditions the citizenship of Ethiopian Jews in Israel, they also have to attend a special school system and the, which is the school system that we read on in the circle of friends that usually they go there and they attend it with the majority are um, students of North African descent and Mizrahi descent and um, and and then there are the Ethiopian ones there now it wasn't just a compromise and one of the most painful uh, quotes I received during this research was um, of Wurkitu uh, a research participant of mine and she said I was 10 when I got my first A plus in math and I was the only one in class. The teacher got mad. How come she got it right and you Israelis didn't? I was so surprised. I was sure I was Israeli. Now, this thing that Ethiopian Jews are deemed as other than Israeli also by their teacher is something that is basically an educational policy now. And it's very hard to explain this um, to people who live in a place like America, which is so organized <laughs> mostly, here you can have a policy and you can have the ground and the ground speaks for itself. And most of the uh, schools that Ethiopian children attend are schools that serve 95% of Ethiopian children. And um, for all the reasons in the world, there are schools that don't allow Ethiopian children um, to enter because they're not Jewish in the way that they deem right, and all these private schools. And the situation that was created in the end, um, I think Pnina Tamano Shata can say it better than I do. She is a Knesset member, the first Ethiopian woman to be a Knesset member uh, from 2019, and she's the current Minister of Aliyah and Integration. She said this, we have become the punch bag of many, many educators who think in their dark minds that they can hurt the physical safety and personal well-being of kids of Ethiopian descent and get away with it. Nobody fires those teachers. No one withholds state funds from schools that don't accept Ethiopian children, and there are many. Ethiopian children are separated in classes, kindergartens, at schools, and separation is the best case scenario. The worst is blunt child abuse that no one is asked to explain. And this is a situation that I think, you know, if Ethiopian Jews were more than 2% of Israeli society, maybe this would have 
drawn more political attention or something. But this has been the reality since Ethiopian Jews made it to Israel in the first um, Operation Moses. And for the 40 years that they have been absorbed in Israel, situation becomes more and more like this. Instead of assimilation, what we see is this. And not only. In the past few years, um, so there have been um, continuous um, rebels of Ethiopian Jews against police violence um, because many deaths of young Ethiopian men that could not be explained um, by anything by police brutality and being very light on the trigger um, happened and brought this, um, this uh, community out to the street um, the, they say here, um, um, policemen are murdering Beta Israel. Now, these are three of the young men, um, Yosef Salamsa, Yuda Biyadka, and Salomon Taka, Yizhram Baruch. And um, the girls that I'm working with, and this is a reality that has um, became more prominent, I think, after the um, the, the story that, that we are reading today has come out, but this is the reality today. And I want to finish this part before we move to the story with a poem of one of my research participants that she calls Nightmares. To understand a bit more, what does it mean? How does it feel like to grow like an Ethiopian Jew in, in Israel? I have nightmares. I scream out my soul. My brother will not be like Salomon Taka, like Yuda Biyadga. I have nightmares, but I can't tell this to my white friends because when they watch the news and see what happened to Yosef Salamsa, they say, oh, it's so sad. But what do they mean by that? Sad like a scratch on your new car? Like a rise in the price of cottage cheese? Sad like missing the bus a footstep away from the station? Like getting a new shirt and the next day it's on sale? What's sad is that I know that one day this will be Addis, my little brother Addis, lying there on the sidewalk. And you will sit at home with a cup of coffee in your hand and say, oh, it's so sad. So sorry for waking you up from your beauty sleep. Um, this very powerful poem um, not only depicts the reality of terror that a, a person who who feels a lack of personal safety um, can feel, it also raises a, a grave question. Um, waking us up from our beauty sleep or maybe an ugliness sleep is something that many Ethiopian Jewish, uh, especially women, have to do. And this, um, the difference, what happened in Israel is that the difference between um, you know being a Jew in a different way, like your challah goes like this, and my challah goes like this, and my ancestry goes like this, and your ancestry goes like this, all of a sudden became a difference of citizenship status. It became a difference in personal safety. And for this reason, Ethiopian Jews have a lot of perspective also into other people who experience blackness in Israel, like Israeli Arabs. And um, so we can go there in a different time. We don't have a lot of time now. And I want to, to give time for questions and for the story. So um, yes, let's let's start um, with who Dalia Bertolin Shellman is. So Dalia was born in 1979 in Gondar, Ethiopia. And at five years old, she partook in the Moses operation in the first exodus, the Ethiopian exodus, that uh, they, they walked the Sudanese desert to arrive in Jerusalem. She was five years old and she was carried on, she remembers she was on either a donkey or on an elder's um, back. Um, her grandmother probably <laughs> and um she has a ba in social work and an mfa in creative writing both from ben Gurion university of the negev and that's where she met professor Igal schwartz um who is a, a wonderful literary editor and a great professor of uh, hebrew literature and he told me he's a good family friend and he told me and he was um our relationship is that many many years ago he he discovered my mother as a writer my mother is also a writer and when i asked about dalia he said listen it wasn't that different from your mother it was just like i heard her there was a little evening that everyone had to share something she read two paragraphs and i was like this is what he told her you must write 
I'll give you my office for one day a week. She said she doesn't have any place to write. And said, no, you'll get an office. And in a year, you will have a book. And so she did. They worked together during that year. I mean, she was just in the office and, and then he, he uh, worked on her writing ever since. And then her book came out. It's called When the World Became White. Not all of it was translated into English, unfortunately. And I think um, whoever um, of you that, that likes to read Hebrew or, or wants to try, it's a fascinating book. It has seven short stories that also tell a, a bit more about the family relations between this girl and her very Ethiopian father and how does that clash with the Israeli reality. In 2014, she received a, a prize for a first novel, but she has she did not return to writing ever since. And I think it's, it's her choice. It's also something that we need to take into account. Um, but she doesn't do it right now. She has two kids. Her husband is Russian and they just returned from America for a postdoc in medicine or something that he did. So this is the, the woman. She's a terrific writer and I wish she would write more um, another book after this, but at least that this will be translated into English. Now, just just um, when I was reading the, the story, I read it first in Hebrew and then I thought, oh, my my um, poor partners for this uh, thing, they're reading this in English. How will they understand like what everything means? And then I thought, you know what, maybe let's take the first paragraph and try to decode it. And, and after that, I would love to hear more of your questions. I, I prepared two other paragraphs that I think are revealing to understand a bit more what does it mean to grow up like an Ethiopian Jew here. But maybe maybe we'll have some more time for questions before and then um, and then we could continue that. So, this is the first paragraph. Me, Ophira, and Rivka are best friends. We sit next to each other, go everywhere together, and never share secrets with anyone else. We are all in Miss Dvora's fifth grade class at the Tachkimoni School, ranking below Adva and her circle of bees, who are the most popular girls. Then come the ordinary girls, like Chagit, who Rivka sits next to. Me and Ophira sit behind them. Me, Ophira, and Rivka are ranked close to the level of the ordinary girls. We're better students than Sally and Shani, who are terrible. At least we got a few satisfactory marks on our report cards. Sally and Shani have normal hair, but they have big, broad shoulders, and they look like boys, and that lowers their rank. And they don't have to go to our after-school group, to the one for the new immigrants, not just from Ethiopia, but other places too. Um, at the very bottom of the class is Tamal Stein with the lice and the runny nose. Tamal is a clique by herself. What we get here is an overview of basically Israeli society in a nutshell, in a coded nutshell, um, that is um, maybe sponsored by the myth that in of Israeli public schooling that says that everyone is the same or should be the same. But what we find here is hierarchies. First of all, let's notice the names. There is me, Ophira, and Rivka. Now, we never know throughout the whole book we don't know what the name of the storyteller is and i think that is salient because as we said names in ethiopia were extremely important for beta israel and here the moment you come to misrada pnim then misrada klita they're giving you a hebrew name and there's a difference between ofira and rivka and my students who told me about the hebrew names that they got and then they they returned from but this is one sort of names that we have here we have miss dvora who is uh, the, the, the teacher. And we have Adva and her circle of bees. Bees are Dvorim and Dvora is a bee. And that's also, it shows you that the, the, the teacher and the queen of the, the queen bee of class are, are sort of in the same clique. Now, aside from them, there's also Chagit and Chagit has Sali and Shani. And what do we know about them? We know that they have um that they're normal that they're ordinary girls and we know that they have normal hair they don't have that great uh, grades and and they look like boys and they're that lowers their rank but they're normal somehow and even though ofira and rivka and the storyteller have better 
grades than Sally and Shani, they're still ranked a little underneath them. Now, for me, the revealing place here in this paragraph, the, the, the revealing thing was, was Tamal Stein. Because Tamar later, um, they they refer to her as someone with blue eyes, just like Adva. But there is something they say she's psycho, she's different, and that difference, that being different, put her at the bottom of the scale with where she is alone. Now, notice the difference in how how do you know somebody is in your rank or not they don't have to go to our after school group that's a big 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 issue um ethiopian israeli kids have to go to these after school programs that are um they say colored black especially for ethiopian kids and they're supposed to be like enrichment classes because they lack certain kinds of education but um, what the kids feel about them is that everybody gets to go home and I have to stick around for enrichment classes in English or something and then the, the teacher ditches and everything. So that's just one difference about how, how do things look. Now we say also that they're the ordinary girls. We have, oh sorry, we have the ordinary girls and oh maybe I didn't um, with the other one, there is also the, the the popular girls, and there is Tamal who is a clique by herself. So these are our people, and they are a sort of microcosm of Israeli society. And if we look at names and at bodies, um, Adva later on, the we know about her that she is the most popular. She has blue eyes, and that she always returns from Florida. She has her thing in Florida and she says the name Florida and all the bees around her are charmed. She is admired by everyone. And after school, she goes swimming. She doesn't stay for the Olim, for the lessons for the Olim. Now, Chagit is a different name from Adva. And I think that we understand how much, I don't know how we can understand how politicized um, these things are, these differences in names are um, from outside of the Israeli context. But um, names like Chagit and Sally and Shani in a certain, um, at a certain time in Israeli history were names that were representative and, and that more belonged to Jews of North African descent, that many of them were given names by the Ministry of Integration that, that absorbed them, just like the Ethiopian Jews. So who gets to name themselves in Israel is a big question. And maybe that, that is a privilege only for Ashkenazi Jews right now. Now, notice um, Shanin and Sally are terrible at school. But other than that, we have many stereotypes here. Their wide shoulders and how they look like boys is a bit how um, when when the Mizrahim came, when uh, immigrants from North Africa and the Middle East came to Israel, um, there was a lot of confusion about how to understand them and how to understand the women. There was like a, a part that saw them as very submissive. They're just like, you know, they do what the men tell them. And another part said, no, they're so, they're so masculine. They're strong. They do like, you know, that, and they, and they shout and they scream and that, and they look like boys. So that also is a part of, um, of, of yes of, of of this uh politics there are the mean and smart boys we see them here in the end that um they call um me live kind of pira grasshead and um, which is where the hair comes in um she said there, there's a girl who has um like straight hair or regular hair she says normal hair is very revealing who has who gets to be normal um and and we know about Rivka and Ophira and me that we are best friends, which means we tell each other everything and no one enters into our clique. And we also know that Tamar is psycho. That's how she's called. She has lies, a snort, and only herself. And she is sort of black with blue eyes. And this is something that I noticed only in the English translation. I noticed two additions that were interesting for me. One was that the the after school program for the immigrants in Hebrew doesn't specify that it's not just from Ethiopia. In English, it does specify that it's not just from Ethiopia, but actually the reality that it is because only Ethiopian Jews came to Israel after the 80s. Like it was, I mean, 
and the Russian Jews never had to go to these places. So you call it Olim, but who is an Ole is like very, that's another way of, of being coded. And I think in an American context, we're talking about black and white and being black is something that is lawful, like has a definition in the law. But in Hebrew and in Israel, there's no such thing as a lawful blackness. There's no definition for a black person, but you do have a definition for an Ole, for a non-Jew, for a Jew. And with these things, we create a sort of social hierarchy between different kinds of Jews. And um, that is a sort of dystopian um, idea of what, what does it mean to be a, a Jewish a national home, a Jewish society. Now, um, one small thing I wanted to show here is how, what does it mean to be an Ethiopian child that you can't say no. In Amharic, there is no word for no. There's just no word for it. You need to find a way without disrespecting the elderly to, to, to say yes in a way that means no. And it's a mastery, like these girls master it, but you can see what happens when Pnina Tamano Shata tells about how hard it is for Ethiopians to be there, that they're treated differently. Um, on the one hand, their parents don't allow them to be rude to anyone and they cannot speak back to their teachers and then when their math teachers ask her them for help to carry like things to the car so of course they do it they don't say no they cannot they're polite but she never asks the other girls to do that she asks only that and as children they're child adults they don't have time for context and and many of these kids also have to raise their little siblings when they're very 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 small um yes that that is too long for the time that we have but maybe we will um find that later um oh i i see um i see already questions um here so so um should i answer the you know what, maybe maybe let's leave this for later. I want to ask a few questions here and then I'll start asking your, you questions. And this is another photo of us from Ethiopia. So what can we learn from the experiences of Ethiopian Jews in Israeli public schools about Israel, Judaism, and the Jewish people? They're a small minority, but I think that they're really, really, really important. If we get that, we might get the entire thing. And that's what I'm trying to write my dissertation about, and it's very hard. Um, how is the lived experience of Beta Israel in Israel similar and different from the experiences of Black people in the US? This is like the bomb question, and I, I don't know how to answer it. I don't have an answer for it. And I, I would be really curious to, to hear you as, you know, you have a, a, dual, a dual citizenship, as uh, Herman Simon says. Um, so, so yes, how do you feel as, as Jews and as Americans about this issue? I want to learn from you. And also, what can be learned from the perspective of Ethiopian Jews in Israel and Black Jews around the world about race, immigration, like global issues, religion, education, and more? Like, are we even talking here about um, an intersection of Jewishness and Blackness? Is it even something else? So I'll be leaving you with these questions. And um, thank you for, for listening to me. And um, we might stop the share for now. And um, yes, I, yes. Thank you thank so you. much, Marva. Thank you, Noah. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure. And I, I see there is a question from Ed Kaplan here. So I would want to answer that first. And then, um, so Ed asks, thank you for your question. On the issue of Jewishness, is the main problem that the rabbinate insists on European halakha? Or is the problem of racism? Ah, I think that's my dissertation question. So thank you for asking that. Um, so I think if you ask me, calling this racism is too simple. And it's trying to make us into something, like treat a, something that was created in, as, as like a self-evidence, like, oh, yes, it's not. Usually when Israelis say racism, they try to naturalize it. It's like, yes, it's everywhere. It's in America, it's in Europe. and it's there. So we also have racism. These people are different from us. But what I'm trying to show in the dissertation is basically that in Jewish history, we've been through many revolutions, but the two revolutions that reached their peak today are the Zionist revolution and the Halachic revolution. 
evolution. The halachic revolution is like over a millennia old. It wasn't just in Europe, but it definitely got like the very last part with Rashi and the Tosfot and everything. And later on, the Shulchan Aruch, it all was in Europe. So when they had a system of classification and they had to look back to Africa, they they didn't really know what to do with that. Another thing is the Zionist revolution that basically defined or redefined a Jewish person as a matter of nationality. And the ideas of what does it mean to be a nation that they had were both ideas that were derived from Jewish history as well as European nationalism. And that sort of essentialism, what is a Jew? How does a Jew look like? Um, these are These are questions that always, always come up. And I think that Talking about racism in a Jewish context has to take into account the fact that Jews are perceived by their haters as one race. And once we say there is racism against the Ethiopian Jews, we're basically saying that that we are one race. We, we are accepting this, this thesis. Now, when you see the halakha, the problem with the halakha is more the problem with the, the law of return. That until 1970, the law of return was like every Jewish person is entitled to, to make aliyah. And the definition of a Jewish person was like very um, uh, loose. In 1970, it was already okay. It has, it's only the halakha and the rabbinate is the one authorized to, to, um, to, to make you into a Jew or like to uh, convert you or to or to recognize you as a Jew and the rabbinic does many conversions mass conversions of Jews from um, from the former Soviet Union but it denies this possibility from Jews who are still in Ethiopia so you see the state of Israel uses uh, the halakha as a political tool and I think that that can lead to racism like to systemic racism as uh, of the kind that we we can see in many other places um but yes thank you for this um for this question and just like the the last thing uh, we all know um of the the horrific nuremberg laws that that defined a person a jewish person um as someone with a jewish grandmother and unfortunately the kind of um definition that the israel that the state of israel leans on most of all is this mother ancestry and that drives me mad when i'm thinking about it and it brings me back to the idea of can we talk about uh, racism in the israeli context without thinking about jews as a race or as not a race um but yes that's that's for your question Ed. Thank you. Um, are there other questions or thoughts that folks have about the story? Um, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Can I ask a follow-up question? Absolutely. <laughs> This uh, is very confusing to me uh, because I, I don't see uh, how, on what basis the, the state can say that the beta uh, are not acceptable as full Israeli Jewish citizens. So, Thank you for this question. I'm so naive. It is no, it's it's it, it is exactly the question to ask. That's the absurd. So the, what they lean on is both. It's like um, both halacha and uh, science. Um, halacha says that yes, like they basically the, the Jewish Ethiopian diaspora was not part of the ongoing correspondence between Jewish communities throughout many centuries of diaspora. So. All the Jews, for instance, in North Africa, in Tunis and Morocco and in uh, Egypt had um, correspondence with uh, European Jewish communities. They were in touch with each other and the Ethiopians were like somewhere different. And then they when when they were discovered all of a sudden, they saw that the difference that the Judaism that they had is a very different Judaism from the one that we now uh, observe. And I think that that's the first like religious difference. Like if you want to say that they're not Jewish or that they're Jewish in a different way, you can do that. Another thing that happened is that 
um, scholars from, especially from SOAS, from London, um, especially Stephen Kaplan, actually, he's a great scholar of Ethiopian uh, Judaism, but he, he, he studied um, under this um, other scholar, his name is Ollendorf, who studied Ethiopian Christianity. And Ollendorf tried to prove that Ethiopian Christians that have been there, you know, since the third century or fourth century, that they weren't originally Christian, that they actually derived their Christianity from somewhere else. And a very, a very similar argument is made on Ethiopian Jews. And I think that, um, Stephen Kaplan even named an article, uh, The Invention of Ethiopian Jews, in which he tries to show how a Christian uh, group um, cut away from Christianity in the 14th century and received the name Falasha, and then all of a sudden they, they became Jews, but only since the 14th century. But, and that became like a reason for policymakers maybe to, to leave them out. And then later on, now there's a part of the Jewish community in Ethiopia, a small part, but that grew, converted to Christianity in a very violent uh, mission that was in the end of the 19th century. And then um, now, or like years later, they returned to Judaism. Many of them continued practicing Judaism at home and they married only among Jews. Their name, it's a mocking name. It's a horrible name. It's called Falashmura, but it's a name that mocks their hybrid uh, Jewish and Christian identity, Falasha Amura. Amura is Christian. And the Christian wouldn't marry them and the, the, the Jews won't marry them. So they, they were like their own group. If there was a definition in Ethiopia for a secular person, they would be secular Jews, like me, like not, uh, you know, doing Shabbat or something like that. So... So, so I think that in the end, when Misrad Apnim came to, to, to whether or not to absorb them, and it said, okay, these people from Russia, they bring me education, they bring me these resources, the doctors and so on. These people with, from Ethiopia, what will I do with them? I will need to teach them to read and to write. I will need to, I don't have, and then the, the Israeli tachlessness just uh, enters in, in its worst, worst, worst way. I think it's even deeper than that, that there is a way, you know, we ask, what does it mean to be black across contexts and in different contexts? And um, whether blackness is being an other, whether it is being an antithesis, whether it is something that doesn't exist. And I think that in, in the case of the Ethiopian Jews, it's like, you know, your brother comes back from the desert after you haven't seen him all your life. And he feels like he knows better than you. What does it mean to be Jewish? And and they they were they preserved the kind of Judaism that can tell us, wait, maybe we are not original. Um, I think that's the problem. That's why they're so because that group is always on the news in Israel, always. And they're so small. They're like the Duruz people and the Duruz people are never on the news and the Ethiopians are always on the news. And I think that it's just because that's something about our identity framework as Jews of European descent. Um, is it is like shaken meeting an authentic Jew of African descent and and trying to understand where what what happened to us in diaspora I think it's 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 one of these questions that Israeli politics is always just too busy to answer and now 70 years later you see how horrible it is not answering these kind of questions for 70 years and then you end up with too many unsolved things like what does it mean to be a Jew and so many differing um, definitions we have no constitution in Israel I think it's one of those questions that were pushed to later when things will be easier and they never became easier so um, so I really hope that um, Israel will will um, you know take advantage of this amazing resource um, to to build itself and to look in the Ethiopian mirror and and to really understand what what are the things that we're we, we're doing right what are the things we can do better and what can we learn and um, you know a community that walked the desert alone with its grandparents and its uh, children and had burglaries and had uh, you know anything you could think of and hunger and, and disease 
and they still survived and they came the entire family. They know something about being a community. And I can tell you also that when we did um, research in Ethiopia, I came with a broken leg. I broke my leg straight through two days after I got the funding to take all my students and their parents to visit their family members. And when I cried, what, how can we get to Gondor if I can't even stand? Alamnesh, my student told me, don't worry on my back, I'll carry you, just come. And I came with, like crutches, I didn't know the language. I was the only white person around. And I learned in flesh that an Ethiopian family is something that can absorb more and more and more people without losing its wholeness. And if there's one thing that Israeli society needs these days, I think is exactly that. Um, so, so yes, that's, that's for your question. Um, I, Maybe I can also return to the um, to the question about corrective education. Um, one of the things that that you saw, and we really didn't talk a lot about the, about the story in those terms, but you see the hierarchies that actually, you know, the myth is ever, we're building a people, but in fact we're just channeling them into different places. And how Ethiopian Jews were channeled in Israel, I think, was extremely problematic. First of all, um, if you would, if that book, uh, Dalia's book, would be translated into English in its entirety, you could read about what does it feel like to grow up separately from your parents, because. Um, 95% of the kids who came from Ethiopia in the 80s were separated from their parents and sent to boarding schools. And, and then they were sent to these special education classes. And every time that there's like a test, uh, like a um, um, whatever matriculation exam, like it doesn't work. There is a very big uh, uh, clash between this community and the education system. And what I did for 10 years was part of a collective effort of many, many people in Israel to try and see what can we help how can we help the the ordinary education system and really like truly doing the the these um these educative um initiatives in ways that that actually open up and don't close you to to who you are so the jewish federation of san francisco as well as, as of toronto both were um giving a lot a lot a lot of support to us and came to visit us many many times um in the little music center that i had in jaffa and many of the activities that we had there and somehow it was important for for american jewish communities that these kids would not only learn math and english and hebrew like they're supposed to at school but that they will have 3d printings and that they will have a community garden and that they will have a sitar a guitar lesson and i think that just it brought it brings back their humanity that something about the absorption process took took away and i also don't want to enter into this sort of you know blaming um it's not that everything in israel tried to go wrong intentionally so many people with the best of intentions were always there the problem in israel is never bad intentions i think the intentions are many 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 times good and yet um, there is a, a complexity here that I think it's better solved and uh, the, than ignored. Um, what is the Ethiopian population in Israel? So it's about 150,000 people and it's a very small community. Most of it is um, in, concentrated in places like Netanya and Rehovot and uh, Kiryat Gat and Be'er Sheva. Some are here in Haifa too. Usually they live in segregated uh, living arrangements, not officially segregated, but like they were the last immigration to come. So they ended up being in the Amidal subsidized housing that all the other communities have already left. And there was this idea of placing them together because uh, the absorbers saw what a community structure they had. And um, so, so they thought it, they would benefit from it, but what ended up being is, is truly um, Ethiopian ghettos in certain places in Israel. 
And some people are like, things are looking different now, especially for women of the younger generation. Um, that I think, and if you, I, I hope to be a prophet on this one, but that we will have a, a black Jewish community whose leaders are women in, in less than 10 years. Because the, the official religious leadership of this community was um, destroyed by, by the immigration process. When the Kes, the Kes has lost the religious authority when Ethiopian Judaism was delegitimized. So, um, so now the women are, they are the ones to make wages also outside because it was degrading for Ethiopian men to work in cleaning or to do these things. They're used to having their respect. So women became part of that society. And they also continued observing Ethiopian Judaism from home and making the food and making the, the prayers and making those things at home. So now they are the heads of both the religious practice as well as making um, the money in the world. And I think that the girls that are doing this research with me in 10 years are going to run the place, hopefully. And um, inshallah, um, are Jews with Middle Eastern roots allowed to attend schools uh, with Ashkenazi Jews? Absolutely. So now that's um, yes, and a really good question. Thank you. The thing about the Mizrahi absorption and what happened to Jews of Middle Eastern roots and North African roots in Israel is now like a bomb that is waiting to accept. Like it's finally people are talking about it. There have been stories like the kidnapping of the Yemenite kids that kids who of Yemenite parents who were born in hospitals, sometimes uh, the doctor came back and told them that the child died in labor, but the child was given to an Ashkenazi family who lost a, fam who lost a family member or who never had kids. Now, you know, it's such a complex story because whoever wasn't a Yemenite Jew was probably a Holocaust survivor or someone who lost their entire family. So like, it, it's all of these extreme complications that happened, but, um, Basically, the, the absorption of Middle Eastern and North African Jews has been in the 50s and 60s often extremely degrading. It had, um, you know, they, they were sprayed DDT when they entered, they had to live in the Ma'abarot, um, and they stayed there for a long time. But there's a great difference between Jews of uh, Middle Eastern and North African descent and Jews of Ethiopian descent, and that's the size. Because right now, Mizrahi Jews of North African descent are more than half of Israel. They're the majority of the Jewish people here. And they are people who come from Arab cultures, from Muslim, uh, Muslim countries mostly. And they, when they came in, the, in, in just the, like 1940s, 50, I think, in the first two years. So it was like 600,000 people absorbed a million and a half, almost, like from Europe and from uh, North Africa. And still, there were so many of them. So they couldn't really, really, really be segregated as much. And they, they, were, um, they were just in the 50s and 60s, they were channeled away from the general school system to the religious one because the, something uh, like the policymakers thought that the, the absorption in the general one is not good. And I think to understand, are they allowed or not allowed? Israel is the kind of country that is very socialist and kind of helps you, but the help is like, um, sometimes it comes with a, with a bit of a problem. It's a double-edged sword because like you get this schooling for free and you get the channel and you get a special person to help you and you get all that and it's presented as something like this and then you do it and all of a sudden you see that the real things you need to learn to make it later are, are in the different school system. So right now there are Mizrahi Jews that go all over to many, many school systems. I must say that I grew up in Jerusalem. I went to a musical high school in the Academia of music and I had two Mizrahi kids in my class so I think that there is a lot of what we see with the Ethiopian Jews is actually you know their skin tone makes visible something that is much deeper in Israeli society and I think that the voice of Mizrahi Jews has been um, silenced for many many decades too long and actually they might be the ones to help solve um you know if they they have lived in peace in muslim countries most of their histories maybe they can teach us to do the same um so i think if only the school systems would um hopefully when i finish the phd there will be some difference there um but but i hope that the 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 school it starts with the schooling um Definitely. Still 90% of the students in the Makif schools, in the, in the religious schools that are public, 90% are Mizrahi, are of North African descent. Um, 
so so yes that's that's definitely it's a vague it's a gray zone um like many things many things here thank you do we have any last question um or thought in the like five minutes that we have left oh, oh i'm sorry um if you if you'd like only if you're interested there is a three minute um video that um the girls and i took from ethiopia that you can hear them talking and explaining the situation in their own words i'll just um I'll, I'll share my screen again. And um, I think it would be a nice ending uh, for this. Just nice. Great. Um, I hope the connectivity will be good. Um, do you see this? The girl singing almost? Okay. Just um, another, just a short explanation. This is us going to Gondal to visit the Jewish community in Gondal. Please come. It's the best Jewish community. Yes, you will see them. It's all their siblings and their brother and, and their cousins there. And they were teaching Hebrew there. And they also had a chance to think about their complex identity between Ethiopia and Israel. So here you are. Thank 
כי זה מה שעשינו עד עכשיו, אנחנו שרדנו עד עכשיו, וגם לצערי מה רק בארץ ישראל אנחנו שורדים. אוקיי, אז... Let's uh, end with, with the words. I hope um, you, you can hear some of this, um, but these wonderful girls, let's end with what Warkitu said, the kind of um, expertise and wisdom that these people bring um, doesn't have to be measured in, in the regular uh, terms. And we might gain a lot from learning from them on their own terms. And thank you for joining me for this journey. It's been a true pleasure. And I learned a lot from your questions and always here. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marva. Thank you for sharing your your research and your learning and and um, and all of this with us thank and guiding so us through this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Having me and thank thank you for being here so early in the morning and wishing you a wonderful weekend. Rest of weekend. Take care. Thank you.